Los Angeles. The name alone is famous enough to conjure up images of glitz and glamour, of crowded Hollywood premieres, of a place as multifaceted as the sun-baked gemstones glittering in Rodeo Drive storefront windows. It brings to mind the scary slim movie stars and fat cat entrepreneurs at the heart of the entertainment industry. The industry most everyone is referring to when they talk of working in the industry. But Los Angeles is more than that, and it's not always nice. The City of Angels is home to quite a few devils and demons, and it has seen more than its fair share of bloodshed. Unfortunately, this is to be expected of a place more complex, more ethnically and socially diverse than most of America. You see, a city as bright as Los Angeles will cast some very long shadows when the sun goes down. For underneath those diamonds and diets, past all the cameras and kale, L.A. has a dark side. As a new arrival to the city of flowers and sunshine, I find that kind of pitch-black past to be fascinating. Every place has a tragic backstory, but this one's in particular is a rich mixture of modern myth and real-world events. And it is that blending of legacy and legend that will be the subject of this podcast. Come with me, won't you? My name is Luis Lopez. Welcome to the City of Sunsets. Our inaugural tale ends in a picturesque little cemetery known as Oak Hill. Section 12, grave number 10, of Oak Hill Cemetery contains the remains of not one, but two people, Robert Entwistle and his daughter Millicent, who was better known as Peg. And although Oak Hill Cemetery is located in Cincinnati, Ohio, our story begins across the Atlantic Ocean, almost 4,000 miles away. Port Talbot is a small but heavily industrial town in Wales. The horizon is dominated by the local steelworks, but the nearby urban district is where Millicent Lillian Entwistle came into the world on February 5, 1908. Robert Entwistle and Emily Stevenson, Peg's mother, had traveled to Port Talbot so that Emily's parents could assist with the birth, which, by all accounts, was uneventful. Shortly thereafter, the Entwistles returned to their home in West Kensington, London, and it is here that Peg first began her love affair with the stage and the screen. Robert Entwistle was a modestly employed actor and stagehand from the time Peg was born. And although Peg must have been aware, even as a child, of her father's humble successes both in front of and behind the curtain, the true rising star of the stage was her uncle, Charles Harold Entwistle, who mostly went by Harold. Apparently nobody used their given first name around here. Very close to his brother Robert, and thus close to the fledgling Peg since the time she was a baby, it is likely that the closeness they shared is what would eventually give Harold the grim duty he would face in roughly two decades' time. But for now, Harold was a prospering theater operations manager, and his renown had allowed him to travel to America in the early 1900s, where he was introduced to New York Broadway. Around this time, as if to counterbalance Harold's adventures abroad, Robert Entwistle divorced his wife, Emily, and he was awarded sole custody of Peg, who was only two. Luckily for Robert, the rest of the immediate Entwistle family was very close-knit, and Peg was not uncared for. She routinely went on excursions with an aunt, and was never far from a retinue of relatives. Peg appears to have had a somewhat normal upbringing, at least as normal an upbringing as a child of divorce can have at the end of the second millennium. And despite the challenges newly divorced Robert faced, he was never in want of employment. When not working in and around the theater, Robert helped out at his father's stationery shop. There, he learned how to craft intricately decorated boxes that were well received by the wealthy. This trade, along with a lucky connection to legendary theater manager Charles Froman, would later allow Robert to move himself and Peg to New York in 1913, closer to his brother Harold, 
and closer to his own eventual fate. On Thursday, November 2nd, 1922, Robert Entwistle had finished a day's work at the stationery shop he operated at Madison Avenue and 54th Street in New York City, as hectic a place back then as it is now. Robert was walking home at about 10.30 at night, a mere 20-minute distance, when a large private car struck him. The vehicle was driven by a chauffeur who exited the car, saw poor Robert bleeding on the ground, and drove off into the night. Robert was just one block from his home. It was election day. Two bystanders who saw the accident took Robert to the nearby Presbyterian Hospital. They did not get the license of the vehicle that struck him, and according to a New York Times article written about the incident, no trace of the automobile had been found. Over a span of 47 days, Robert was moved to a second medical building and then to a third, Prospect Heights Hospital in Brooklyn. It was there that he would draw his last breath. Robert was almost 51 years old. When the vehicle hit Robert Entwistle, it broke his backbone in two places and forced part of the spine up into his brain. He was undoubtedly paralyzed, but it must have been the injury to the brain that ultimately caused his death. Well, okay, it was the car and the dark road and the uncaring driver, who may or may not have been drunk, that would be the cause of the whole thing, but one leads to another. It's just one link in an unbroken chain of tragedy. It's astonishing to imagine how much might have changed had that car not hit him. For one thing, the two bystanders who helped Robert would not have gotten his blood all over their own car. For another, Peg Entwistle would not have ended up fatherless. And maybe she would not have come to Hollywood, the place of her own link in the chain. And maybe then she would not have done what she did. Maybe. But that car did hit Robert, and he died on December 19th, 1922. Peg's uncle Harold told the New York Times that he would take his brother's body to Cincinnati, Ohio on the 20th. He would be buried there in Glendale Cemetery, which would later come to be known as Oak Hill Cemetery. This location of burial is not random. You see, back in 1911, Harold fell in love with the woman who had familial roots in Ohio roots that he would come to share. Bertha Jane Ross was an American actress from Elmwood Place, just north of Cincinnati. Jane, as she liked to be called, see what I mean about nobody using their first name? Was quite liberated, intrepid, and strong, more akin to a force of nature than a mere person. And her meeting Harold set his path on an entirely new course. According to biographer James Zarek Jr., Jane was a hybrid dowager who mingled comfortably amongst the upper crust of Manhattan socialites and Boston bluebloods, while remaining down to earth enough to spirit a horse into a breakneck gallop or command her coal automobile to its limits. It's not difficult to understand why Harold fell for Jane. There is an attraction to someone like that, a boldness of their personality that acts on some of us like an event horizon. Often, that boldness can be perceived as off-putting if it doesn't come with a complementary warmth of character, but Jane seemed to possess both in equal measure, and Harold had zero chance. He was smitten from the start. Jane came from money, though that didn't seem to have been as corrupting an influence as it would be for other adventurers, for that is what Jane really was, an adventurer. She had a successful career as an actress, but it seemed like this was just an offshoot of her thirst for the unknown, or perhaps something that allowed her to satisfy that thirst. We all do what we must in order to do what we want. In Jane's case, it was incredibly fortuitous that she enjoyed both her jobs and her passions. The family estate of the Rosses was in Ohio, but Jane's career as a traveling actress also allowed her to own a gorgeous home in Santa Monica, California. Santa Monica, close to the Los Angeles film and theater scene. 
and Los Angeles being the theme of this podcast. See? We'd get there eventually. Harold and Jane began a spirited marriage in which Peg became Jane's niece. Young Peg immediately liked her fun new aunt. Peg's father was also impressed with how the Ohioan beauty carried herself. Jane was a positive influence in the life of the then five-year-old starlet, being someone for Peg to look up to both literally and figuratively. But Jane was also someone who helped directly shape the course of Peg's life. You see, it was actually Harold and Jane, and the latter's bardic demeanor, that allowed Robert Entwistle to move himself and Peg to New York City in the first place. Back in 1913, aboard the transatlantic ocean liner RMS Olympic, Harold and Jane met the previously mentioned theater manager Charles Froman. After a successful and timely encounter with Froman, the duo were presented with an offer to employ Robert and move him out to New York for work as a stage manager under Froman. When the Olympic had finished crossing the Atlantic, Charles and Jane informed Robert of the gracious offer, and he accepted. Shortly thereafter, he and Peg came to America. Harold was staying in New York at the Hotel Flanders when Peg's father died in 1922. The Hotel Flanders, a filming location for 1968's The Odd Couple, no longer exists. Before he died, Robert had written a last will and testament, which stated, I do not desire my said daughter to be at any time in the custody or control of her said mother. It was decided that Peg would be cared for by her aunt and uncle. Harold left the hotel with then 14-year-old Peg in tow, and he and Jane did their best at raising her. Despite the unbearable pain that Peg felt at the loss of her father, the absence of her sole true parental anchor, she never gave up on her long-cultivated dreams of acting. Only three years after being rendered something of an orphan, Peg lands in a minuscule but meaningful part in a Broadway show. It would be her first professional acting role. Walter Hamden Doherty, who thankfully chose to use his given first name, although he dropped the last name for professional reasons, was an American Broadway actor who came to manage the Manhattan-based Colonial Music Hall from 1925 to 1931. The structure had gone through many name changes over the years, and actually no longer stands, but during Hamden's tenure it was known as Hamden's Theater, and it produced Shakespeare shows. Hamden, who was starring in his own production of Hamlet, gave Peg a small part in the show. On October 10, 1925, Peg appeared on stage as a bearer of the king's train and a holder of the poison cup. Although she was uncredited in this role, it is from this moment that Peg's career both on and off stage began. And it is less than a decade after this moment that Peg's career abruptly ends. During this period, Peg spent a good deal of her time traveling back and forth from Boston to New York, or traveling from theater to theater in pursuit of the next role, or even traveling across the country if the show called for it. The first part of a career in acting can be rough, and Peg's was no exception. But in the process of paying her dues, as it were, she also gained a bit of notoriety for her abilities as an actress, and helped to inspire future legends of Hollywood, just as she was inspired by her Aunt Jane. In early 1926, Peg was a member of the Henry Jewett Players, a theater troupe performing at the prestigious Boston Repertory. Peg had been given the role of Hedvig in Henrik Ibsen's play, The Wild Duck. Hedvig was the troubled daughter of a Norwegian family dealing with the fallout of secrets, and Peg's portrayal of her was well-received, even impressing a young Betty Davis who was in the audience for a January performance. In her memoirs, Davis would state, A whole new world opened up to me. I was thrilled with Miss Entwistle's performance. Davis saw much of herself in Peg, writing, my heart almost stopped. She looked just like me. By the end of the play, captivated by Peg's performance, Davis is taken aback when Hedvig, desperate to earn her father's love and devotion, takes a gun up into the attic. A shot rings out. It is assumed that Hedvig has shot the family's crippled wild duck. In a way, 
she has. Hedvig, troubled Hedvig, is carried downstairs in her father's arms. Hedvig, whose vision had been failing, chose to shoot herself in the chest in a final bid to prove how much her father loved her. Davis is stunned. In a last-minute realization, Hedvig's father puts aside all the family's secrets and lies and decides to show his daughter how much he loves her. But that moment has passed. Little Hedvig, the wild duck, is dead. It's a moment that Davis would recall years later as an inspiration. If Peg could embody a character that deeply, then so could she. But while Betty Davis would go on to become a living legend of Hollywood, Peg Entwistle would not. A year later, Peg met a very charming actor named Robert Keith. Similar to Harold and Jane's, Peg soon found herself in her own whirlwind marriage. But while her aunt and uncle's relationship was one of warmth and adventure, Peg's marriage to Robert was tempestuous at best. Robert was known to be a ladies' man with commitment issues, and this undoubtedly caused difficulties. But what seemed to cause the most mistrust was the fact that Robert was having extramarital affairs, and that he had been married before. While hosting a dinner party for friends, a deputy sheriff knocked on their door and demanded $1,000 from Robert in back alimony for his first wife. It also came to light that Robert had a son that Peg knew nothing about. Two years later, Peg was granted a divorce from Robert. She was 21. Soon after her divorce, and for a long time after, Peg turned to drinking to dull the pain. She found continual work on stage, but it did nothing to fill the void that had started to grow within her. In addition to her failed marriage, Peg was facing near-constant monetary struggles, which were only exacerbated by the fact that Robert had stayed out of jail solely because Peg helped pay the back alimony to his ex-wife. And despite critical praise for her acting work, Peg found herself in a deep depression that would follow her for the rest of her life. All three years of it. It's worth noting that Peg's chosen coping mechanism, alcohol, was not only frowned upon, but also illegal at the time. This was during the height of the Prohibition era, and alcohol consumption was seen by those in power as a national epidemic. And while drinking is no longer seen as a universal bad thing in America, it is still not a good way to deal with personal demons. Nor, it turns out, are drugs. A friend of Peg's introduced her to opiates, possibly as a way to help Peg break out of the rut she was in, possibly for simple fun. Regardless, neither narcotics nor liquor helped relieve the young woman's pain. In addition, Peg's Broadway prospects began to dry up as the Great Depression was gaining steam in New York. Struggling to make ends meet, both financially and emotionally, Peg turned to a relatively new outlet, the blossoming Hollywood film industry. It was to be her last beacon of hope. In May of 1932, Peg took a bus to Los Angeles. She stayed with her Aunt Jane and Uncle Harold while looking for permanent work. Their house was located at 2428 North Beachwood Drive, Los Angeles, California, 90068. The house still stands, though it's dwarfed by apartment complexes and multifamily homes. The Hollywood sign is visible from the street, just as it was when Peg arrived, eager to reinvigorate her career. Well, not exactly as, but we'll get to that. By the end of May, Peg was back on stage in the play The Mad Hopes, featuring a young Humphrey Bogart, as well as Billy Burke, who would go on to play Glinda the Good Witch of the North in The Wizard of Oz. Peg also dated Bogart for a brief time before his meteoric rise to stardom. An Entwistle family member would meet the actor while visiting the Beechwood Drive home, saying that Bogart was a very nice person, and there was nothing haughty about him, nothing I am a star, or anything like that. The Mad Hopes was harshly reviewed by critics, but Peg reportedly stole the show. 
After the play closed, Pegg landed a role in the movie 13 Women, distributed by Radio Pictures, which would later become RKO Pictures, Inc. This was to be Pegg's first and only film role. 13 Women is an early psychological thriller about revenge and murder, and Pegg's part was a smaller supporting role. Pegg played the role of Hazel Clay Cousins, a woman who kills her husband. Pegg's scenes amounted to only 16 minutes of screen time, but they were nonetheless important to her. However, after the film went over poorly with test audiences, Pegg's part was cut down to only four minutes. In a piece of bittersweet irony, Pegg would not actually see what would become of her part in 13 Women. While in Los Angeles, Pegg found small roles on stage here and there, but she was unable to revitalize her career using the motion picture industry like she had wanted. At the same time, she still battled her depression and feelings of failure and hopelessness. And although her uncle Harold had forbade her from drinking to cope with her pain, which was arguably a good thing, in doing so, he took away an escape that Pegg had come to rely upon. She became increasingly isolated from her friends and members of her own family, even refusing her Uncle Harold's offers of financial assistance as she didn't want to be a burden. Seeing no way out of her circumstances, Peg told her Uncle Harold that she was going to meet some friends at the local drugstore, but this was a lie. On the night of September 16th, 1932, Peg left their house on Beechwood Drive and walked to the nearby base of Mount Lee. High on the mountain, she could see the brightly illuminated Hollywood sign shining in the night sky. She began to climb. The city lights twinkled below her as she reached the massive south-facing sign, but the view of the city only served to underscore the success that Peg had been denied. She removed her coat and laid it on the ground along with her purse. A workman's ladder had been left leaning against the 50-foot-tall letter H. Peg climbed the ladder, losing a shoe in the process, and reached the top of the aluminum structure. In the quiet of night, completely alone, she felt that the best course of action to be rid of her pain and loneliness, to finally be free of her failure, was to kill herself. So she jumped. Peg was just 24 years old. It has been theorized by a number of people over the years that Peg chose the Hollywood sign as the place from which to jump because of the symbolic impact such a gesture would make on the industry at large. That ending her life in this location would call to attention the manner in which the Hollywood machine seems to grind up talented people, reducing them to nothing more than pretty, penniless faces, and then, finally, to nothing at all. But this is simply not the case. In 1932, the Hollywood sign was known as the Hollywood Land sign, specifically containing the word land, and it was merely a hillside advertisement for a housing tract located in Hollywood. It was not what we consider it to be today. Pegg's choice of location from which to vacate this earth was not symbolic. It was convenient, which, if anything, is even more tragic. The Hollywood Land sign was not frequented in 1932 like its current iteration is today. It saw the occasional hiker, but it was not revered or emblematic of stage, cinema, or anything like that. In fact, many locals saw the sign as garish, a pockmark that disfigured an otherwise gorgeous stretch of the Santa Monica Mountains. It was treated in much the same way the Eiffel Tower was at first. Reverence only came with the passing of time. But unlike the famous French Tower, the Hollywood sign has been changed and defaced, both legally and illegally, so much over the years that you actually aren't allowed to approach it anymore. There is a grid of fencing, cameras, and motion detectors in place that alert the local rangers if anyone comes too close. 
This is not to suggest that people don't still illegally climb up to and or deface the Hollywood sign. They still do, most recently as of January 1st, 2017, in which someone changed the sign to read Hollyweed for the second time since 1976. The prankster-turned-icon was an artist named Zach Fernandez, who goes by the moniker Jesus Hands. Fernandez wounded his holy hand in the process of altering the sign with large tarps, and he later surrendered to the LAPD, who are planning on charging him with trespassing. What this all means is that recent movies showing characters sitting on the letters of the Hollywood sign and overlooking the admittedly stunning cityscape at sunset are in a way, lying. Just straight up lying to you, but for artistic reasons. I'm sorry to break that to you. Although the sign can't be approached these days, Peg was able to climb up to it in 1932. Peg went to the Hollywood Land sign because she knew she would be alone, and that no one would stop her. High above her body, Peg left behind a suicide note that read, I am afraid. I am a coward. I am sorry for everything. If I had done this a long time ago, it would have saved a lot of pain. Signed, P.E. An anonymous woman found Peg's belongings the next morning. She phoned the police and said, I was hiking on Hollywood Mountain, and near the Hollywood Land sign, I found a woman's shoe, jacket, and purse. In the purse, I found a suicide note. I looked down the mountain and saw a body. I don't want any publicity on this, so I wrapped up the purse, shoe, and jacket and laid the bundle on the steps of the Hollywood police station. It would take Harold days to become aware of the suicide note, go to the morgue, and positively identify the body as that of Peg and Twistle. The cause of death was noted as multiple fractures of the pelvis. A small Episcopalian service was held for Peg at the W. M. Strathers Mortuary at 6240 Hollywood Boulevard. That road was sometimes known as Heartache Avenue, in recognition of the shattered hopes of those who, like Peg, sought their dreams, only to be given failure in return. The mortuary has since been demolished. The service was attended by family, friends, and fellow actors who had worked with Peg. Her remains were cremated before being sent to Glendale, Ohio, for burial next to those of her father, Robert. Their shared grave was apparently unmarked until 2010, when the Star Markers Foundation, which itself may no longer exist, was able to raise enough money to have a proper headstone commissioned. It now marks their grave. Peg's dreams of making a mark on the entertainment industry may not have come to fruition in life, as they don't for so many others, but her actions have cemented a lasting legacy in death that she likely never anticipated. In late 2014, a public gathering was held in the parking lot of the Beechwood Market in Hollywood. It was an outdoor tribute to Peg, a screening of her movie 13 Women. Proceeds raised from the sale of raffle tickets on site and concessions were given to the American Society of Suicide Prevention in Peg's name. In 2010, Australian playwright Alex Brown wrote a one-act play based on Peg's Last Night on Earth. Over the course of the play, Peg contemplates what it will mean to commit suicide, and if she can go through with it. Taking place atop the massive letter H of the Hollywood Land sign, she is accompanied by the ghost of English poet Thomas Chatterton. It is a fascinating look at Peg's mindset the night that she died. The play is called The Letter H Girl, and it can be produced and performed royalty-free. Filmmaker, biographer, and general creative type Hope Anderson writes in her blog, Under the Hollywood Sign, It's hard to live near the Hollywood sign without thinking about Peg. Nearly 77 years after her tragic, premature death, she is as much a part of this neighborhood as any living resident, casting a long shadow over the canyon where she lived. That shadow may still be there to this day. In 2015, the campy Travel Channel paranormal series, Ghost Adventures, focused an entire episode on the various ghosts and ghouls that supposedly haunt the Hollywood sign. 
According to an anonymous officer patrolling the area, Peg's ghost is often seen below the sign around midnight. The officer makes no mention of the scent of gardenias that, according to a different paranormal drama show, foretells the appearance of Peg's spirit. If you've a mind to make a pilgrimage to Peg's various locales, let me set you on the right path while also giving you some advice. Peg's Beachwood Drive residence is, to the best of my understanding, still that, a residence. I think people still currently live there, so maybe don't disturb them. Taking photos of the house from the street is probably fine, as I think that's considered public land or something. But try to resist the urge to knock on the door and ask what's up with Peg. Don't be that guy. Nobody likes that guy. As far as Peg's final resting place, it's worth noting that there seems to be some confusion regarding the location of Oak Hill Cemetery. Many will state that the small village of Glendale, Ohio lays claim to the territory, and thus the final resting place of Peg, but technically it's located within the city boundaries of Springdale, at least according to Google. Apparently Swiss about the whole thing, the cemetery's website lists a Cincinnati address, and yet the northernmost edge of Cincinnati is roughly five miles south of Oak Hill. Both the city of Wyoming, Ohio, and the village of Woodlawn lie in between. I can only assume this is because Cincinnati is a city of almost 300,000 people, and it has likely been heard of outside the state, whereas Springdale at 11,000 likely has not. Or maybe Cincinnati, much like L.A., is a sort of city of cities, and Springdale is a part of it in that respect. Regardless, the common address for Oak Hill Cemetery is 11200 Princeton Pike, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45246. Entering the cemetery from the main gates, Section 12 is the first area on your right. In the north end of Section 12 are the Entwistle family headstones. You won't have to walk very far. When you see the large gravestones bearing the names Ross or Newton Hall, you're in the right area. Look just behind Ross. I had said that our first tale ends in a cemetery, but there is one last thing worth mentioning. A persistent Hollywood legend states that the day after Peg Entwistle chose to take her own life, a letter arrived on her doorstep. The letter was from the Beverly Hills Theater, and it contained an offer for the lead role in a stage play concerning a woman who was on the verge of suicide. City of Sunsets is written, researched, and recorded by me, Luis Lopez. And when I say researched, I mean it. I've included a list of all my sources for this story in the show notes, as well as in the transcript for those who are curious. There's more than 20 of them. Other items of interest relating to the episode, including a PDF script for offline reading, are available on my Patreon page. They're little curiosities, or things that I found interesting that didn't make it into the episode. To see other things I have written, just type my name into Amazon. You'll find a trade paperback graphic novel called The Last Templar, illustrated by my good friend Brandon Noel, for which we ran a successful Kickstarter campaign. You'll also find a literary collection called 8-Bit Pulp, which I have contributed to for, I believe, every single issue so far. I am humbled to be included there, along with other amazing writers that I think you'll enjoy. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>